You're listening to the Gospel Coalition podcast, equipping the next generation of believers, pastors, and church leaders to shape life and ministry around the gospel. Today, you'll hear a message from Al Mohler, originally called Why Younger Generations Should Invest in Institutions. This breakout session was originally delivered at TGC's 2019 National Conference in Indianapolis. The topic is why younger generations uh, should invest in institutions, why younger Christians should invest in institutions, care about institutions. participate with institutions and find some identity uh, in those institutions. So welcome, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I had a, a bit of question in my mind about how many people would come to hear why younger generations should invest in institutions. The common wisdom is that the younger uh, generations, uh, especially the millennials and Generation Z, are particularly anti-institutional. And so it's something of a test case to hold a session and to find out how many people show up from those generations. But it is a huge question and one that evangelical Christians have often not deeply considered. We have, frankly, not considered social institutions at all, social structures and the relationship between social theorizing and then eventually institutionalizing. We haven't given much thought to that because we have taken certain institutions for granted and uh, evangelicalism itself has been defined by a number of institutions that only now do we recognize uh, might have been relics of some evangelical past rather than representations of the evangelical future. I was glad to take this assignment in uh, conversation with many of the others on the council or the Gospel Coalition, this is a pattern that has been detected. It's a question that has come up over and over again. And it is also one that is far larger than the evangelical equation. This is, this is a generalization, which is, by the way, where the word generations also has direct application. Uh, to generalize by age cohort uh, is to speak of generations. And uh, that's what we're doing. Of course, generations also comes from to generate and comes from a birth cohort. But it combines in a very interesting way here because the generalization is that we are looking at an anti-institutional future. And the society around us is going to have to ask some basic questions about what that's going to mean, what it means to politics, what it means to education, what it means to business. But for evangelicals and for Christians, there are, if anything, more pressing questions. Now, I want to give you an illustration. There were, there were some signals uh, about uh, an anti-institutional bias that kind of entered into public consciousness. Most importantly, I would point back to the year 2011. Now, you could look backward to, say, the 1960s, where you had the hippies. Uh, the New York Times ran an article just a few days ago about the 1967 BN that was held in uh, March, I think it was March the 29th of, two th- of uh, 1967. So it's a long time ago. A B in, just B man, just B. Uh, it was a protest centered in being, also centered in drugs and other things too. That was a part of being, <laughs> according to those who were at the B in. But uh, part of the message of the 60s was down with the man, but the college students who have been saying that were the first to try to line up for tenure in the academic institutions as soon as it was available. So the baby boomer generation had an anti-institutional moment, but it was quickly retranslated into uh, actually a takeover of the institutions, as we shall see. But it was different in 2011. And some of you will remember September the 17th, 2011, and the launch of Occupy Wall Street. Now, it is interesting that enough time has passed since 2011 that a lot of the people who we now describe as young, we're so young, or are so young, uh, they don't remember Occupy Wall Street. But Occupy Wall Street was a response, it was claimed, historically situated as a response to the Great Recession of 2008 and the claim of the failure of capitalism. Thus, it began in Zuccotti Park near Wall Street. But what made Occupy Wall Street interesting and 
perhaps even more interesting in retrospect, is that it claimed to be merely a movement. It was not going to institutionalize. It basically organized around the principle of anarchism, which is a recipe for disaster. You, you want a short-term movement, then be committed to anarchy. Uh, and, and by the way, the only lasting arguments for anarchy are held by institutions that claim to be anarchist, but have CEOs. So go figure. But nonetheless, there were three principles given by Occupy Wall Street student leaders as, the, as, as their new form of a movement. Horizontalism, autonomy, and defiance. Horizontalism, everybody's equal. And autonomy, all that matters is the individual and uh, defiance. So the press immediately said Occupy Wall Street is going to change the world. Of course, it didn't. It didn't come close, partly because they couldn't even release a statement. Uh, because if you are an absolutely horizontalist movement, then nobody can speak for you. And, and so it turns out that that's a problem. Also, nobody can raise money for you. And before long, you stink. And they move you out of the park and your movement is over. And that's basically what happened. Uh, by the way, I interrupt this for a commercial announcement. I was told to remind you that this is a sponsored session. This session is sponsored by the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. <laughs> They've given me some suggested text. I will simply say, in summary, it is the most fantastical, super, unbelievably faithful, singular and most important theological institution on the planet. <laughs> You can learn more by going to sbts.edu, which is, by the way, an institution. <laughs> I have a vested interest in this issue. If you do look back to the 1960s, it's very interesting. You had the, the, the revolutions that took place, 1968 worldwide, most importantly in Europe and in North America, student revolutionaries that, uh, that took to the streets. Lots of rioting, lots of protests. Complete political disruption. Interestingly, what that produced was the political class of, uh, of the left in the next generation. So, I mean, some of the people who were actually arrested for terrorist activity in the 60s became ministers of government in Germany and in France and some of the other nations later on. But what was interesting, uh, Rudi Dutschke was famous for saying that what the 60s protests would launch would be, quote, the long march through the institutions. Now, that is sometimes attributed to the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci. Gramsci didn't say it, but he should have, because that's basically his argument. But it took uh, Rudi Dutschke to come along uh, as an activist in the 60s to announce that the revolution would only actually happen through the long march through the institutions. Marx and Engels recognized this. They didn't say that, uh, that the revolution would lead immediately to a removal or a destruction of all institutions, but rather all the institutions of the old regime would have to be recaptured to become engines of uh, enforcement and uh, social control for the, the new regime. And the, the long march through the institutions, which, by the way, was a deliberate reference back to the 1930s with Mao's long march in China. The, the long march through what? Through the institutions. The, the, the Marxists said, what we will do is bring about revolution one institution at a time. What's so important there? Even the revolutionaries recognized they had to have institutions on the other side of the revolution or they would not have a revolution. They would just have a revolutionary spasm. That is not what they were hoping for. If we're going to talk about institutions, perhaps we need to just make a very clear statement why we would make this argument. It is because institutions are the central control authorities in a society. Society by society, they are the central control uh, authorities, and they are the control of the culture and central to cultural production. Culture is produced by institutions that take the shape of cultural momentum and exercise the authority in a society. So there is no civilization without institutions. Uh, civilization equals institutions. Civilization equals more than institutions, but never less than institutions. Let me define the term. An institution, this is my definition, 
is an organization for lasting purpose and commitment and concerted action. It's an organization for lasting purpose and commitment and concerted action. If you have certain convictions, you, you want to accomplish a certain purpose, and you want it to last, you want it to exercise concerted action, then one way or another, you create an institution, or you take over an institution, uh, or you further an institution, because it's institutions that accomplish that in society. And it has always been that way. Now, modern institutions are far more complex. Uh, they are far more recognizable than many previous institutions. But if you have civilization, you have institutions. We are told that uh, younger generations prefer movements to institutions. They want to be a part of a movement. They want their identity to be with a movement rather than an institution. I think all of us can understand that in spirit. The problem is that movements end up being ejected from the park. Uh, institutions have the lasting stewardship. And, uh, and by the way, that is something that's reflected. If you just think in the political sphere, just fast forward from Occupy Wall Street to the current conversation, just to take a snapshot, say in the uh, Democratic presidential nomination process, you will notice that all the argument is institutional, all of it. All the debate amongst the various presidential uh, contenders in the Democratic Party, they are all institutional. Even Bernie Sanders, maybe especially Bernie Sanders, is institutional. The man is in the United States senator. Hard to come up with a more institutional institution than the United States Senate. And I do mean that sociologically, not in terms of psychiatry. But it is an institutional institution. Um, now, some of you get that over dessert tonight. That's all right. <laughs> Movements form institutions or they disappear. Now, this isn't to say that movements are never important. Movements are important. They just don't last. And lasting change in society comes through institutions. I'll, I'll try to help make that concrete as we move on. We do not want our causes, our passions, our convictions to disappear. We certainly do think of biblical, gospel-centered Christianity as a movement, but that movement has to take institu institutional shape, or it too will disappear. So an institution is not merely a cause, though there's a cause behind every institution. It's not merely a brand, but any successful institution is a brand. Now, that's contemporary uh, economic speak, but we know what we mean. Just think of Andrew Pedigree's brilliant book published in 2017, Brand Luther. Now, the St. Andrew's historian has wrote this great book on Luther as a brand and Luther's attentiveness to a brand. And Luther started a movement, but he did so from within a university uh, and within the church. It was an institutional reformation by its very definition. The, the 95 theses were a call to the Pope, to reform an institution. Let's think in terms of biblical theology for a moment. What, what do we think of institutions as we try to put the question in the frame of biblical theology? Well, first of all, we go back to creation and the orders of creation, and we understand that in creation, several institutions were given to us even in Eden. Even in Eden. Most importantly, the institutions of marriage and family, but also less recognized, the institutions of society and industry. And those are in Eden. They are in the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. They're in the command. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. It's, it's in marriage and the marriage conjugal union as a man and a woman for reproductive purposes, uh, raising their children. The, the institutions of marriage and the family are so cellular, they are actually so molecular to society that, uh, that they are the first in the orders of creation to appear. And they were not human inventions, but rather this is a part of the goodness of God's creation. We automatically, just by reading to ourselves Genesis 1 and 2, we'll see the institutions of marriage and the family we might not so readily see what we should see are the institutions of society and industry. 
And uh, the, they, they are in the, the command to rule and to take dominion. They, they are in the imperatives of dominion and stewardship. Social context is immediately made very clear. You, can't, you cannot exercise dominion without concerted human effort. And, uh, and furthermore, if you are also faithful to the command to reproduce, you're going to be creating society. Society is there. Of course, it's an Edenic society in expectation. Industry is there also in dominion. Now, by industry, we don't mean just what Charles Dickens described as the dark satanic mills of the Industrial Revolution. We just mean basic human labor that is turned into a productive purpose towards productive ends. They are all there. So as we're thinking about the most basic institutions, we would see marriage, family, society, and industry in Eden, at least anticipated in Eden. But we don't live in Eden. We live after the fall. And after the fall, the most important institution given by God is not just society, it's government. And, uh, and that appears very quickly, for example, in the Noahic covenant in Genesis chapter 9. And it, it appears in the very first uh, criminal judicial uh, application, and that is, of course, that uh, if one takes a life by premeditated murder, then society is to take the life of the one who has committed that premeditated murder, precisely because the destruction is not just of a human being, but particularly an image bearer of God. You can't accomplish Genesis 9 without government. You can draw a direct line from Genesis 9 throughout the experience of Israel, where you have other institutions that are given. The most important institutions given are the temple and the monarchy. So as you're looking to the Old Testament, just trying to think in the flow of biblical history and biblical theology, by the, at the very least, we have a divine declaration of the, of the institutions of marriage, family, society, industry, government, monarchy, and the temple. I'd love to be able to expand on all of these. But Israel is institutional. It is defined institutionally. Where those institutions are found, well, first of all, society, human culture, humanity is defined institutionally in the Edenic institutions. And then government is a worldwide mandate given from God as a universal institution. But the temple and the monarchy, they are what define Israel, even in the messianic promise. Again, it's a, it's a promise which will involve both the monarchy and the temple. Shifting to the New Testament, the most important thing we can recognize is the continuity of, of the fact that God's people are in institutions. Most importantly, they are defined by an institution, which is the church. Upon this rock, Matthew chapter 16, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is more than an institution, but it is never less than an institution. It is given order, it is given uh, uh, polity, uh, it, is, it is given identity. Uh, very clearly in the New Testament, you come to the distinction between those who are in Christ and those who are not. Those who are in Christ are ecclesial. They, they are a part of the church, and, and we are to gather ourselves together uh, as the visible church. And by the time you get to the end of the New Testament, there are functions given to the church, and to individual congregations that are essentially institutional. The church is defined by its marks, as the reformers would argue in the 16th century. They're institutional marks. It is interesting to note that the arrival of Christ, the new covenant in Christ, does mean the end of an institution. When the veil was torn in the temple, when Jesus said, it is finished, that spelled the end of the temple. The temple, theologically, even historically, according to the scripture, did not end when, uh, when you had the destruction of the temple in AD 70. It ended when Jesus said, it is finished. The form continued, but the institution uh, was already over, fulfilled, not canceled, but fulfilled in Christ as the great high priest. And so you have the passing of one institution, which is the temple, and the inauguration of another, which will never, ever cease to be, 
which is the church. Even in eschatology, we see a continuation of, uh, of institutions as a part of God's plan in the new Jerusalem. One of the things we need to recognize in the new heaven and the new earth and in eschatology, and again, evangelicals and uh, superficial evangelicalism offers an eschatology no one should actually want. Uh, such a, I mean, this the stupidity of doing nothing. I can still remember as a teenager being told, you're not going to do anything but sing praises to God for eternity. I'm just thinking, choir practice for eternity. Uh, as a teenager, that just did not sound like a vibrant representation of the kingdom of God. But rather, we come to understand that when we reign with Christ, we are, we're actually... We're in a situation better than Eden. I love the way Calvin put it in the very structure of the Institutes. Uh, Because of God's purpose of salvation, we know God not only as the creator, but as the redeemer. And our situation in the new Jerusalem will be infinitely greater even than Eden. Uh, Nothing will ever rust. Nothing will ever pass away. Everything we do will last forever. There are several principles to be drawn, thinking institutionally, from the Christian biblical worldview. And um, in, in some ways, the Catholics are way ahead of us in thinking about this because of the structure of natural law thinking. And this is an issue for evangelicals. That would be a fascinating uh, breakout session just on that question. It would be a fascinating lifetime of consideration for that matter. But we need to remind ourselves that evangelicals believe no less than Roman Catholics in the natural law. We disagree with Roman Catholics in two issues about the natural law. The first is whether or not sinful human beings can apprehend it. And, and then secondly, we differ about the mode of Christian argument as to whether it should be explicitly scriptural or grounded in natural law. But we need to recognize that there is no controversy or should be no controversy among evangelicals, amongst evangelical Christians in the fact that the natural law helps us to understand what is revealed in Scripture. So it's not our primary mode of theological argument, but natural law reflection does help us to flesh out what is explicitly given to us in Scripture. So this is where the natural law principle, for instance, of subsidiarity is so very important. And uh, this goes back to the natural law argument, goes back to the Middle Ages, in which the argument is that truth, being, beauty, human flourishing subsists in the most basic of institutions and then are, uh, are diluted in presence and in competence at every abstraction from the most basic institution. You think, well, that is why I came to this session. I, uh, I desperately wanted to think in these abstract terms. This isn't abstract. I know it sounds that way, but it's really not. This explains why the most basic institution is marriage. The next is, is family. This explains why the most efficient economic political educational unit on earth is the family. It explains why if the family is weak, nothing else can be strong. It explains why if the family fails, no outer institution working outward from the family can be as competent as the family. Uh, In the the pre-conference I spoke on, it takes a church making reference back to Hillary Clinton's book, It Takes a Family, from 1996. I put that in the political worldview context then. But that was a lot of the controversy. In other words, yes, there's a role for government, but and most evangelical Christians would know to argue that government can't do what only the family can do, but they would lack the specific structure of argument to make. Subsidiarity is the structure of that argument. And again, it's rooted institutionally. It's, it's thinking institutionally, As we do biblical theology, we come to understand why that's so. It's not just something that uh, sociologists would note. It it is something that's deeply rooted in a biblical logic. Again, we have to move on. Society is built by institutions. So if you look at the history 
of, uh, of Western civilization, just to take that which is closest to us and uh, from which we're speaking, you would see the, the kinds of institutions as guilds. This is one of the most important developments in the early medieval period. You had guilds, professional guilds. You had guilds of tanners and of, uh, and of artists and iron workers, metal workers, and all the rest, and, and the guild, and teachers, and guilds became what we would now call unions, associations. Where you find Western civilization, especially moving into the modern age, you find this massive development of associations. And, and they're perplexing to a lot of people. And uh, for instance, I was, uh, I was being driven by one of my interns who is from a, a, a different nation, a, a European nation. And he said, was it, what is it about small town America and elks? Uh, I don't even think there are elks here. And, uh, but he saw the honorable order of the elks on signs. I was wondering, what? I mean, elks are not holding a meeting there. What, what does that mean? But that's just a part of the development of this associationalism that was massive. Uh, in the late modern age. And you see the associations for this, the associations for that, more about that in just a moment. Schools, colleges, and universities. And, uh, and then eventually the development of professional schools and graduate education. Hospitals, corporations, uh, museums, think tanks, and of course government and quasi-government. And uh, that has been the most massive expansion. If you look at the 20th century into the 21st century, the massive institutional change has been more than anything else in government, which has institutionalized more uh, than anything else. When I was preparing to uh, speak across Europe in 2017 for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the lecture series I did was on Christianity and the European university, the rise of the university. And I came across something from Clark Kerr and uh, uh, he was the chancellor of the University of California system in the 1960s, which was not a great time to be chancellor of the University of California system, and he didn't last long. But he was famous when he was, uh, when he was the chancellor of that system because it was the biggest, most influential, richest university system in the United States. He was a keen observer of history and of institutions, and he made a fascinating argument that has stuck with me ever since. He said, if you look over the last 1,000 plus years, now he's speaking from the 1960s. So when he says uh, the previous millennium, he meant before the second millennium. We, we can just generalize and say, say over the last, say, 1,000 years, there have only been three continuous institutions that exist today. That's really a very interesting observation. There are only three institutions with an unbroken uh, institutional history of over 1,000 years. And, uh, and they are, number one, the Roman Catholic Church. And number two, the British Parliament. And kind of barely over 1,000 years, but, uh, but there's been a recognizable system we would call the British Parliament going back more than a thousand years. And then the third category would be eight medieval universities that still exist today. Very interesting. So that's it. And of course, he was pointing mostly to the university. But if you're looking over a thousand years, say, what's lasted a thousand years? That sounds like a good question. What's lasted a thousand years? The Roman Catholic Church, institutionally we mean, the British Parliament, and eight universities. That's it. Nothing else institutionally has survived uh, for a thousand years. Now, of course, Clark Kerr was not looking at the Edenic institutions. And as a matter of fact, even in the 60s, you could take marriage and the family for granted as institutions. In the English-speaking world, the 19th century in particular saw the rise of this massive associationalism. And, and this really is a bit different in the English-speaking world than in the rest of the world. The rest of the world, uh, continental Europe, they don't have so many associations. They had the guilds and the labor unions, but the British, the Americans, and the Canadians were association wild. Um, a lot of them were charitable. Some of them were, uh, were fraternal. Uh, had to do with the fact that men were lacking in male companionship, so that's why they started the Honorable Order of the Elks and the, the everything else. Uh, they're, of course, medieval. By the way, someone 
Someone might say, someone might say, just might say, I'm not going to follow this rabbit trail, that uh, masonry would be uh, another institution that lasted more than a thousand years, but Clark Kerr didn't talk about it, neither mine. It's a different thing. But this associationalism, you, you just take London, for instance, you had the development of organizations such as the Metropolitan Association for Improving the Dwellings of the Industrious Classes. I like that. Uh, there were lots of these. I, I have a couple of favorites. William Hague, uh, the former uh, foreign minister of Great Britain, gave an address at Westminster Abbey on this associationalism. I happened to, uh, to be there about that time. I got a copy of his speech. And he talked about this very same thing. And he, he pointed to uh, associations in London in the 19th century, such as the Society for the Prevention of Injury to Boys Who Are Climbing in Chimneys in Order to Clean Thereof. I want to join. You know, I, we should do that. And the Society for Providing Housing for Women Who Are Unmarried, Never Married, or Previously Married, and Who Have Seen Better Days. I mean, I, I, they, you could at least say, as politically incorrect as that is, that you have no question what that organization is trying to do. And uh, that was evidently the rule in the English-speaking world, just add words if you need further definition. But that points to something else, which is important for us to recognize. In the English-speaking world, one of the things that has guarded democracy and freedom has been the existence and the public support for what are called mediating institutions. Mediating institutions. Peter Berger, the sociologist, Richard John Newhouse, um, uh, they and many others, Newhouse and Berger actually wrote a book together on this in the 1970s. The, uh, the English-speaking world's mediating institutions have preserved human dignity and human uh, freedom because they are a necessary buffer between the government and the individual. And so it's just very interesting, those mediating institutions. You could have, you, you could, people could come together, they could, have form, they could form associations, they could establish schools and universities, they didn't have permission from Washington uh, they, could, uh, they could create Little League, they, all these associations, all these institutions, they could establish hospitals, they could do all of this. But Berger and, uh, and Newhouse both, both pointed out that if you take theology out of the picture, just think of the church sociologically, the most important mediating institution in Western civilization has been the church. The, the church has functioned as the most important buffer between government and the individual. Uh, something which, by the way, they were raising the alarm about as early as the 1970s, looking at the secularization of the culture, saying, if indeed, just thinking sociologically, just not even theologically, but thinking sociologically, if the church wanes in its influence, then nothing will buffer the, uh, the individual from the government. It will, uh, the, 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 the necessary check upon that power will be gone. It's about the same time that evangelicals began to think about institutions in ways we hadn't before because we took institutions for granted. But it is interesting just to look at the history of the evangelical movement and reflect upon the fact that uh, evangelicalism, the new evangelicalism, the Carl Henry, Harold John Ockengay, uh, Billy Graham, the, uh, the movement that emerged out of the ruins of the fundamentalist modernist controversy in the United States in which the, the modernists got control of all the mainline institutions. That's, that's what happened. They got control of all the divinity schools. They, by, by the time you reach, say, 1935, 1940, the theological liberals are in control of the entire infrastructure of mainline Protestantism. And thus, conservatives are out. They had a battle. Conservatives lost. And so what did conservatives do? Well, they started institutions... Um, now, but they were fragile institutions. They started institutions. They, they were kicked out of divinity schools, and so they started Bible colleges. And so you can look at, across the evangelical world, and you can see how this happened. And those Bible colleges, sometimes like the Bible Institute of Los Angeles that became shortened to Biola, just to take one example, it, it grew from being a Bible Institute to being a university. Uh, but it You'll notice that that meant that conservative evangelicals were about a century behind the liberal denominations, and thus 
we have never achieved any kind of institutional parity. We, we will never achieve that kind of institutional parity, uh, I predict, because we have convictional boundaries that prevent us uh, from ever achieving that kind of institutional parity. Um, you can imagine what some of those are. Well, if you have to hire and uh, you have to admit on the basis of confessional and even now moral uh, criteria, then you're cut out of uh, the sources of legitimation and, uh, and of funding uh, that, that you have in the, uh, in the mainline Protestant world. The new evangelicals tried to say, let's create, let's jump over the, the, uh, the Bible college movement uh, with uh, its fundamentalist roots, and let's try to create some uh, fast, just add water and stir, add big money, institutions to join the mainstream. And so you may remember that Carl Henry Ockengay and others, including Billy Graham, J. Howard Pugh, who was funding it, uh, who was then the, uh, the founder of the Sun Oil Company, or Sunoco, uh, they put all this into it. But then they figured out it was going to take the equivalent in today's dollars of about a billion dollars just to start one university that could uh, hopefully grow into be a research university. And it turned out that evangelicals, number one, didn't have it. That's a problem. And number two, if they had it, wouldn't spend it on this. Um, because at the very same time that the mainline Protestants were pouring all of their money into institutions of cultural dominance, evangelicals were pouring money into institutions of great commission purpose. So that's, that's, that's the bargain that evangelicals made. It's a theological decision. We're going to put far more money into missions uh, than we're going to put into something else. And... Uh, Anyway, it's just interesting to take that little institutional snapshot of evangelicalism. James Davison Hunter, uh, in his book, uh, To Change the World, he, he comes to the conclusion that evangelicals made a bad deal. He does a lot of cultural analysis, which is extremely bright, in which he points out that ideas last because they become, in his words, embedded in very powerful institutions, end quote. That's important to understand. Ideas last if they are embedded in institutions. That's absolutely right. No argument there. He points out that if you look carefully, the most important actors in history have often not been individuals but institutions. And uh, institutions have given platforms for individuals. But if you take the institution away, the, ins the individual is never known, never has a voice, never has the opportunity for that kind of leveraged influence. Uh, he also points out that revolutionaries who demand an end to institutions almost never, well, in fact, if their revolution succeeds, they never actually destroy the institutions. They just take them over. That's what happens. As we think of missiology in the Christian future, I, I want to point to three realities. Number one, the necessity of institutions. So even though younger people may think, I don't, we don't need institutions, I just want to be part of a movement, the movement's going to disappear. The institution will last. Uh, and so... It's really important for us to recognize that if our convictions are going to last, they will have to be institutionalized. Now, most importantly, our confidence is that means the church, which we don't have to establish. Christ did that. And, and, the, Christ is going to, and the church is going to endure by the promise of Christ. So if not here, then somewhere. But, you know, the people who say... Uh, institutional presence doesn't matter, just go with me to Turkey. Almost all Paul's letters were written to Asia Minor. In most of those places, you can't find a church for the last 13 or 14 centuries. It does matter. It matters for the Great Commission. It turns out that you can't have the Great Commission without institutional platforms to send institutions. And Missions will not last if you don't have institutions, most importantly the church. But churches pretty quickly need other institutions, which is the logic of denominationalism. Denominations don't exist in order to suck the blood out of congregations. Uh, I think millennials think of you know, denominations as the vampire. Uh, denominations uh, exist because churches need one another in order to accomplish what they cannot do on their own. And many of those churches are only explainable because of something, whether you want to call it a denomination or not, uh, you are denominational. 
This is what happens. You, you gather together for concerted purpose. And that means somebody's got to organize it. Somebody's got to call the meeting. There's got to be some convening power. Somebody's got to develop the strategy. Somebody's got to come up with the money. And somebody's got to be accountable for this. We live in what the sociologists call a fully rationalized society. And you don't know what that means? It, it doesn't mean everybody's offering rationalizations. It, that may be true, too. It, it means that the society is rationalized such that you have got to follow rational processes, which means you have to have an audit. You have an audit, you have an institution. If you don't have any money, you don't need an audit. If you have money, you need an audit. An audit cries out institution. Somebody's got to sign it who's responsible for it. So all of this just points to the fact that people who think we're just going to be part of a movement, movements don't have audits. Mission agencies do. And movements don't pay you. Mission agencies do. And movements almost never survive you. But institutions do. I look at my own history. I mean, I, I, I was baptized in a church that was established. I grew up in Florida, so the history's shorter. You know, about 60 years before I was born, which is pretty old for Florida. You can do the math on that. Um, but then I, I went to a college that was established, you know, in the, in the 1840s. I went to a seminary established in the 1850s. I, I was able to walk into buildings I didn't build. I've been eating from, from groves I didn't plant, drinking from wells I didn't dig. And, and the assurance I have is that if the Lord tarries, when I die, someone is going to make sure the institution I serve continues. Somebody's going to be sacrificial. Somebody's going to be strategic. Somebody's going, to, somebody's going to care enough to make certain that that mission is perpetuated. That takes institutions. Secondly, the morality of institutions. Institutions are not immoral because they're institutions, but there are immoral institutions. Because an institution is the fleshing out, the organizational representation of ideas and convictions and, and passions and purpose for action, then you can have moral action or immoral action. So institutions should be judged just like we would judge individuals. There are people we would want to be associated with, and there are those we would not want to be associated with. But we've got to kind of flip the equation, I hope I'm helping us to see, uh, for younger believers, that means many younger evangelicals, to understand the institutional form is not the problem. The problem is distinguishing between the right and the wrong institutions and, uh, and, and investing in the right ones, avoiding the wrong ones, and uh, where necessary, creating new ones. Of course, there's another thing here, which is the, the stewardship uh, of institutions. Uh, my, my second point is the morality of institutions. I'm kind of segueing over to stewardship for just a minute. Is that, and this is the, the, the evangelical predicament from the beginning, how much do you expend on recovering an institution that needs to be strengthened or corrected? Or, or how much do you invest in starting a new institution? Now, almost no one says, I'm starting a new institution. They say, we're starting a new movement. But the movement's got a website and an address. And, uh, and so you really are creating a new institution. The question, that's a balance. And I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, obviously, evangelicals will answer some of those same questions differently. And uh, there's not a right and a wrong answer to that. But the stewardship imperative is a very important part of this. The third point I want to make, the necessity of institutions, the morality of institutions, then the risk of institutions. Institutions are a risk. In a fallen world, they're always a risk. And, and so I have, I have donors sometimes ask me, and say, well, I know Southern Seminary is absolutely faithful to the Scripture now, but what assurance do I have that it will be 100 years from now? And I have to say, zero. No, I, I don't mean that, actually. I don't mean zero, so I back off of that. I say, he'll, he'll, you know, his, history doesn't offer us any assurance other than upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, but you look at any institution, college, university, I mean, we've lost most of them. We know that. The risk of institutions is that we lose them. The problem is if you don't have them, you don't exist. If you do have them, you may lose some. You will lose some. But the good news is that faithfulness subsides in and continues in the institutions that are kept accountable 
and faithful. So we can't deny the risk. Uh, one of the things I point out to the person who says, you know, what, what assurance do I have that if I give a million dollars to your school for its endowment, it's going to be safe? I say, look, I'm, I'm going to trust the average Southern Baptist over time to hold this institution true more than I would trust any elite, uh, more than I would trust any self-perpetuating board. The best assurance we have is the grassroots Southern Baptists elect the board of trustees of this institution. And by the way, if we lose the whole Southern Baptist Convention, then guess what? The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary is doomed. Uh, but I don't have a better bet. <laughs> and I, I actually have a lot of confidence in that grassroots conviction. But it's a risk. It's a risk. Having children's a risk, brothers and sisters. Uh, establishing a new church is a risk. No one... I can't say this. Rarely, if ever, was a liberal church planted. Okay, enough. It was stolen. But nonetheless, that's, that's what happened. And, and by the way, that's why they have all the beautiful stained glass and the pipe organs and the real estate. The real estate, the real estate, the real estate. Just go to New York and realize, okay, I want to plant a church. I'm going to get the soul patch. Got the black turtleneck. I am going to establish a church. Where? Where? And you know, I'm saying this with affection. I mean this with most sincere affection. We need every gospel church in New York City just to take one example. Paris, Montreal, Washington, D.C. But where? All the properties owned by, they were established as Orthodox churches, but they're gone now. We can't, and they don't want you to meet in them until they're so desperate that they can't pay their light bill. And just maybe you can meet in their basement. So all, all that's just a part of the risk, but it's a, it's a risk we have to take. So why institutions in conclusion? To steward mission. Number one, to steward mission. Um, this is how you do it. And of course, I mean after marriage, family, and the church, what we would call institutions, steward mission. Secondly, they perpetuate message. And this is one of the reasons why in the Reformation or even in the early church, you saw creeds and confessions. We want to make sure the message is straight and perpetuated. I just wrote a book that came out last week on the Apostles' Creed. Now, how many institutions have maintained one message for that long? I mean, in its current form, you're looking at the, at the, at the very latest, 390. And, and, of course, the whole point was this is going back to the apostles in terms of what the apostles preached by the claim and by the remnants and the fragments and the truth. It was, it was all already there, even the earliest church. Name another institution. I don't think the British Parliament's kept its message straight for over a 1,000 years. They haven't kept their message straight for the last 15 minutes. Look. Um, so th that, that's a very powerful thing. You want to perpetuate message? Look at the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, and then institutions that are accountable to that church. That's where message is perpetuated. Just look at political parties. You know, for instance, in the United States, are they free trade or not? Well, it depends on when you look at them. Um, I don't have time to trace that, but you see it. Number, th number three, uh, to endure over time. There's a, there's a reason why institutions last. People believe in them, they invest in them, and they endure over time. Fourth, to spawn or give birth to other institutions. It's one of the most amazing things. It takes a strong institution to create another institution. So if, if you look at uh, even how schools are formed, it's often a few members of this faculty will move over and, and start this new school. And, uh, and before you know it, it's a thriving institution. It does the same, hospital by hospital. This is the way it works. And of course, this is the very genius of, of church planning. This is the book of Acts. And fifth, uh, to exercise influence. That's not accidental. We really do give ourselves to institutions because we want to perpetuate and exercise influence. If you don't want influence, then just don't do anything. But if you do anything, it's one way or another because you want influence. We hope to want the right influence for the right reasons, accountable to the church, but perpetuated over time. And I am, no pun intended, over time. But it has been a privilege to think about these things with you. And I pray that because of our generation and the generations to come, the right institutions uh, will be invested in in order that generations not born 
will continue in faithfulness in the Christian faith. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Gospel Coalition podcast. For more gospel-centered resources, visit thegospelcoalition.org.